there have been many questions about when physically we can return to the arts and what that might look like. Barrington Stage Company in the Berkshires has our first glimpse. It's taking out seats, overhauling bathrooms, and relying on doctors. All for the curtain to go up in August. Julianne Boyd, thank you so much for being with us. You're the first one when I'm back in the studio. It feels so great. Oh, that's exciting. Well, welcome back. Welcome home again, right? <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's apt, I think, that we're talking to you here because I talk to so many people who say that they, with all of this uncertainty right now, they don't see a path forward. They don't know what the path forward is. But you've made one at Barrington Stage. Tell me what you're doing. I really wanted to see if I could find a way in the midst of all of this that when the pandemic started, you know, not like plateauing, but really reaching a bottom level, was there a possibility to have people in the theater, knowing there will never be always zero risk, never, not even when there isn't a pandemic, but we could certainly minimize the risk. So we immediately closed the smaller theaters because we were thinking of social distancing. It's hard to social distance when you have small spaces, of course. And we said, what if we took out every other row? What would happen if we took out every other row? What would the number be? The financial model should be a stage two model rather than a 520 seats where we normally do like Pirates of Penzance, South Pacific, on the town, these gigantic musicals. Let's make it a stage two. And for now, let's just say we had one performer on the stage because we want it to be as safe as possible for the performers. One performer and not a lot and no backstage crew. We wanted the performer to be totally safe we found a play called Harry Clark, a play that I've wanted to do for a while with an actor who's worked here, Mark Dold. We said, it's the perfect play. It has no set. It has one costume. It has no set. It has the stage painted a certain color, and it has a deck chair. No <laughs> set for me. And well, then we would have a lighting designer. Then that raises the question, do you have a sense of whether people are going to be comfortable enough to go into the theater? Well, that was the next thing. And actually, I, I should say, we really thought about that first or concurrently with, okay, one actor on the stage is great. So we said, what, what's gonna make people comfortable? First thing was everybody has to wear a mask. And then how are we going to clean and sanitize the theater? So we realized that we had to we had to buy, we did all the research we could. I know more now about electrostatic sprayers and, and air ventilation flow than I ever thought an artistic <laughs> person would need to know. So we bought uh, two wonderful electric static sprayers that spray the seats. We actually bought it from a place here in uh, Lennox, Zogix, which uh, they do sanitation and disinfectants in hospitals and gyms. So they were well experienced with this. And then we said, okay, how about the air conditioning? We need to change the amount of, you know, return to air, you know. And so we decided every night we met with our, we met with our company and they said, you can, you can purge all the air every night. We said, fabulous. What about programs? What about tickets? What about people coming in entrances? So we came up with three different entrances for the three different sections in the theater and no tickets. I mean, people will go in, we'll take their temperature. Hi, welcome to the theater. Two people go in, we wait a while. Next two people come in. We only have 163 seats with three entrances. Well, I want to ask about that because... Everybody, again, that I've talked to so far, and I'm glad that you're the outlier here, has said the moment you start taking tickets out of the theater, that wrecks our financial model. It's not doable. Well, that's certainly true if you did the same shows, but you can't do the same shows. I mean, we, we were planning to do South Pacific, you know, with 20 some people. We couldn't do that with 163 seats, but we can do one actor in a show called Harry Clark. That financial model works. This is not a financial model that this theater could continue with. I mean, we will not, we could not have the staff we have. We couldn't maintain our buildings, but as a trial to see if we can find a way to start bringing people into the theater, maybe other theaters can learn. We're, we're already learning, like what would be the next step? What else would we do? Actors Equity, the, the union that represents actors, has weighed in and said most shows there is some level of intimacy that you're seeing on stage. Actors are coming in close contact. How do you contend with that going forward? You don't do those shows now. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, common sense tells us you're not going to do a show where people are going to be kissing and hugging. We just can't do that now. It's sad, but it's, it's, the, it's a new norm. It's a new reality. In the fall, for instance, we want to do a show, Arthur Miller's The Price. Fortunately, those four characters in the play don't get along. <laughs> How does it feel to be one of the first, if not the first, who's going out there? I mean, are you nervous to, to do this? No, nervous, concerned, maybe. The season is selling really well. 
People want to get up. Ann Hampton Calloway sold out. We added a performance. That performance sold out one day. One day it sold out. Well, Julianne Boyd, it's great to speak with you. It's great to be talking about theater that's happening physically again. Thank you for doing that. Congratulations. My pleasure. I also recently spoke with Dr. Joseph Allen at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He's the director of its Healthy Buildings programs, and he's teamed with the American Repertory Theater to develop guidelines for theaters going forward. And we wanted to know what we need to know about re-entering spaces. Dr. Joe Allen, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So as we all inch closer to this moment, which is feeling more real as we begin to be able to think about going into museums, theaters eventually, and then concert halls, I know one of the big issues is, is having people have the confidence to reenter these spaces. So what do you tell people to look for, museum patrons, theater goers, for healthy buildings? We have to look for these cues uh, that tell us how seriously these, these different uh, organizations are taking these protocols to keep us safe. Um, it's really incumbent upon the organization to communicate their strategy and to communicate it effectively because there will be things that you'll be able to see, right? You'll go in and you might see that they have uh, good signage, markings on the floor, where to stand, their employees are wearing masks. That'll tell you right away. I know that a lot of arts organizations are kind of in a panic about how much they feel they have to do to get their spaces ready uh, for patrons again. Is it manageable? You know, I, I do think the risks are manageable. We could always put in controls to keep people safe. So while the pandemic feels really unfamiliar to all of us, there are elements that feel quite familiar to me in terms of how do we take the science of how we're exposed and how this is transmitted and align up appropriate control strategies so we can reduce risk, knowing that there's no such thing as zero risk, but we can reduce risk to a level where people, people can feel comfortable about returning. I was on a, a call where you spoke to a lot, to a lot of arts leaders uh, within the city of Boston. And as you started talking about systems and changing systems, I know that there was a panic immediately about these are all nonprofit organizations. Can they afford something like this? Yeah, you know, I've been really mindful that uh, in making recommendations since early February on healthy building strategy, control strategies, to not make recommendations that people can't do. Really, it gets down to the basics, just like the basics of hand washing. It's time for the basics of healthy buildings, and it doesn't have to be expensive. It's a misnomer that only shiny new buildings can be healthy buildings, or that these have to cost a lot. Uh, actually, it doesn't cost a lot. In fact, upgrading your filters costs a couple dollars. Are arts institutions at all different, given the volume of people who go through? First, we start with that science of, of how uh, the virus is transmitted. So large droplet, fomite, or contaminated surfaces, and airborne. Then you line up the control strategies. And there are definitely some challenges in theater, like large numbers of people, right? And these kind of choke points as people enter through security or ticketing. How are you going to handle concessions or the bathroom at intermission? That's where it really gets tricky. You just mentioned bathrooms. I understand those are actually really key to the safety of buildings. First is probably the one people most likely think of, and that's you have a lot of surfaces that they can touch, right? And so ideally you get to a no touch or touchless experience uh, in the bathroom with the sinks and automatic doors and things like this. The other one is this, we know that this virus can be detected in stool, sometimes for several weeks after the person has symptoms. We also know from other scientific research that when you flush a toilet, you generate bioaerosols that can stay in the air for some time. So we want to address that mode of transmission. And the way to do that is to make sure that your exhaust system is functioning in the bathroom. You want air to move from clean areas like the hallway or the adjacent space into the bathroom and out. Uh, there are myriad other surfaces that, within arts institutions too that are revenue generating. Restaurants, concessions, gift shops, bookshops. Should those be operating uh, immediately as we start to move forward? Can you stagger or increase the amount of time that people have to enter? Can you increase the intermission period? Can you put on shows maybe that don't have an intermission that are shorter? Um, and then for concessions, can you reimagine this in some way? Maybe you order ahead of time, you know, when you get to your seat and your, your, uh, your chocolate and your, and your water are just waiting for your, your seat so we don't have this crush happening uh, and, you, and you have this occupant density you can't manage. You are working with the American Repertory Theater to develop a, a series of frameworks that will be shared, well, I guess, the world over internationally so, so people can have a better understanding. Is there a go-to? How do people decide whether it's safe to open within because it is so region-specific? Yeah, so we put out this roadmap for recovery and resilience. We hope it's a good resource. We have to have a slow and measured restart. 
In fact, there should be a phased approach for theater, just like for companies. And finally, I don't know what kind of an arts guy you are. I assume you're something of an arts guy if you've partnered with the ART. But what's your own personal level of, of confidence in going back into these institutions, theaters, museums, what have you? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I'm definitely, you know, I'm a, a consumer of theater. I love it. My, my wife and I, my family and I love it. Uh, as for myself, yeah, I would go back to these theaters if these controls are in place. Much like we talked about at the beginning of the interview, I will be doing my own check, right? Even looking ahead of what kind of messaging are they sending out? How are they communicating the control strategies they're putting in place? And when I get there, I'll assess it for myself too. Much like I would if I go get takeout at a restaurant. There's some that are doing it really well right now and some... I don't really want to go back to anymore. The same thing will happen with arts, theater, you know, museums. It'll all depend on how they're communicating that messaging uh, out to the public. But if they're doing it right, I'll go back for sure. Well, Joe Allen, excellent guide and advice. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate this.